Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, guys, so we're in Luke 2. And, and uh, when we're Luke 3, it's Advent 2. The season we're in is the season of Advent. Thank you, Confirmants. Advent, okay? Advent is it's the coming. That's what it means, the coming. And we're coming towards what? What are we waiting for? The coming of who? The Jesus, the Messiah. Um, and we're also uh, preparing ourselves for the return of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will. Are you ready? That's what we talked about last week. Are you ready? John the Baptist is here with us today to, to make sure and really ask, are you ready? Uh, and, and I want to say the importance of who our gospel reader is today. Uh, so how many gospels do we got in the Bible? Four. Yeah, you say it with confidence. Four. And this is really important for us to know this as Christians. God gives us breathed inspiration to have four gospels. Four. Not one, not two, not three, but that, that's, that's like one movie with four camera angles. So what the, the church does, the Episcopal church, is every year we get a different camera angle on Jesus. What Luke talks about might not be what Mark talks about. And what Mark talks about is certainly not what John talks about. He's using a whole different camera. This is important for us to know the importance of having multiple lenses, how this is biblical, how you need to have multiple lenses and you need to wrestle with the gospel because you might be like, well, wait a minute, why is Mark saying this? And that kind of conflicts with what Luke is saying. That's good. It means you're paying attention and you're wrestling with Scripture. But we always need multiple lenses. Having Reverend Patsy here is so good. She is so different than me. So you might hear the same passage preached on. It's going to be very different. Two different lenses. Thanks be to God. We reveal new things. The Bible's teaching us that. Life of Jesus, four lenses. So the church says every year we, dedi we, we commit ourselves to one of those lenses. So for another 50 points, what was the, who was the lens that we focused on all last year? Was that you? Yes, it was Mark. I'm expecting the confirmants to be jumping in. But yes, it was Mark. Mark was our lens. Now this year, year C, our lens is who? Luke. Now it's important for us to know who Luke is. What was Luke's job? He was a doctor. Very different than Mark. Luke's kind of smart. He's like Dr. Belleville over there. He's very smart, okay? Went to school, knows his stuff, and he is very detailed. It's a very long gospel, very wordy. He's also very educated. So his Greek is phenomenal. Mark's Greek, eh. It's like Father Christian speaking Spanish. It's innocent, it's okay. Hey, you kind of get what he's saying, but you're like, I don't know, I don't know. right? Luke, very, very detailed. So you n we never want to take one word for granted in the Bible. And Luke 3, where we're at today, if we could bring up Luke 3 up on the screen, just in verse 1, I want to just take us a little bit to show us the importance of us to really dig in the Word. And if you brought your Bibles, go to Luke 3 right now. And if you have a phone, go to Luke 3. Because I want to take us just through these words and to show how important is what's being revealed. On first take, this just looks like a bunch of names that Father Christian had trouble pronouncing about 10 minutes ago, right? That's all it looks. Just a bunch of names and years. But Luke is being very intentional about what he's saying here with all these names. Luke is writing at a time when there's a lot of, 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 of Greco-Roman lore and myth. Different Roman gods and Greek gods. People sitting around campfires telling stories and myth and mythology. Once upon a time, there was the god Zeus. This is not a once upon a time. Luke is letting you know right away in case you were wondering if this Jesus is a fairy tale, this ain't no fairy tale because Luke is about to leave receipts. He's leaving breadcrumbs so you yourself, if you're doubting who this Jesus is, can go and go look, look it up. He starts out with, in the 15th year, so now we know exactly where we're at, the 15th year of the, uh, of the rule of Caesar Tiberius. Oh, oh, now we're talking about the emperor. Now I know where we're at. We're in the Roman Empire. Okay, thank you, Dr. Luke. It was while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Oh, wait a minute. That's another Pontius Pilate, that guy? 
Now I know exactly where we're at. Now it's getting even tighter. Now we're in Judea. So we've got Caesar Tiberius. Underneath him, there's some kings, and underneath him, there's a governor, Pontius Pilate. See, watch this funnel. See where Luke is taking us. Herod, ruler of Galilee, so you know the context. Oh, this is during Herod's reign? Okay, I know which new historians to look at when I want to go try to show that this Jesus wasn't really born, didn't really exist. And he says, I'm going to go even further. His brother Philip, ruler of Iturea and Trichonotitis. Not necessary information, but he wants to give you receipts. He wants to know exactly where we are, why we are, when we are. And most importantly, who were the influencers? He's telling you who are the most important people in the time that day for the reason for his story. Then he goes on further. So Michael, just keep on tracking me on this. Licinius, ruler of Abilene. And then now here comes, during the chief priesthood of Anas and Caiaphas. So he talks about the emperor, talks about the governor, talks about the tetrarchs. And then now he's going to talk about the biggest who's who in, in religion, the chief priests. Anas and Caiaphas. Anas is uh, uh, the, the father, and then the, uh, Caiaphas is the son-in-law. These are the who's who of religion. So he's got everything covered. You know I was going to do this. Come on up. Come on up. All right. All right. You've done this before. But it's been so long. It's been since the pandemic, okay? So now Luke has given you receipts of where we are, when we are. This is not once upon a time there was this guy, John. And he was really weird. He lived out in the woods, and uh, he ate locusts, and, uh, and he started talking about this guy, Jesus, long, long time ago in a galaxy far. No, Luke is saying, on this year, under this ruler, under this governor, with these priests, I'm about to tell you something, okay? This is for anyone out there when someone says, oh, that's so cute, you go to church, you still believe in that fairy god? Okay, tell them to read Luke. Luke gives them receipts. They can look up all the historians who were there and alive documenting all this. Now Luke is going to drop some theology on you. There's a reason, though, also why Luke is doing this. He says, first, we got Caesar. Caesar Tiberius. People called him the son of God. This is the son of God. He's the most powerful man. Now, under Caesar, he has three kings working under him, three tetrarchs. Okay, so one, two, three. Come on. There we go. There we go. Come on. It's all, it's all part of the confirmation process for Christian to embarrass you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we got a Tetrarch 1 right here on the right, Tetrarch 2 in the middle, Tetrarch 3, okay? Real big, big news. These, 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 these are some bad dudes right here that Luke just mentioned. This is everything. These are the political who's who. These are the influence. He's got at least 4 million followers right over here. Let me get your collar, though. Unless you're you trying to pop it? Yeah. No, okay, good. All right. <laughs> then he says, now, we gotta, now we're going to go even a step lower. Now we're going to go for a governor, Okay. Teddy, come on. It's not, it's not a sermon without Teddy. Okay. So then underneath all them is a governor named Pontius Pilate. Hi, guys. I'm Pontius Pilate. What's up? Okay. Pontius Pilate, bad dude, too. You didn't want to cross him because he has a whole Roman Empire supporting him. Now, under him, though, are the who's who of priesthood. These are like the popes. Benny, come on up. Graham Graham, come on up, okay? Because whenever you see Ben and, 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 and these two and Graham, you think Pope, right? Okay. All right, here you go. What are you benching, like 350 now? Close. Okay, okay, great. All right. So now, but for real, Anas and Caiaphas, these guys are it. I mean, this is for, 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 for religion. They cover everything. So when you look at this picture right here, that is the world that Luke is saying. And out of all of these powerful people, these incredible influencers who could just snap their fingers and your life is over, the word of God comes, it says in the Bible. The word of God is going to come and shine down. And we're wondering, where is Luke going with this? Where is the word of God going to go? And it says, okay. Where, where, where the real of the generals are going to rest? Okay. So the word of God is going to come. It's going to shine down. It's going to shine upon the emperor, the son of God. Is it going to shine upon the Tetrarch, one of the Tetrarchs here? <gasps> no, it's going to go to the religious guys, the guys with the collar. Of course it's going to be one of them. No, Luke says, and then the word of God came to John. 
Who's John? Are you John? Do you need John? Where's John? I mean, he's got to be part of the powerful people, right? I mean, God's going to be about to come into the world. The Messiah is about to come into the world. He's surely going to be part of the most powerful people, the biggest influence of, of, of our day. Who's John? John, son of who? Ze Zechar oh, Zechariah. He's like that priest guy in that small podunk town out on the sticks. He's a nobody. That's who God chose to reveal this word? I mean, we're all the way out here. All the way out here. Through this guy. Here we go. <laughs> this little guy out here. There we go. <laughs> All right? No, I mean, this is like out in the, out on the boonies. That's where God shows and gives him the word to this guy, John the Baptist. Who's John the Baptist? He's just some dude, nobody. John the Baptist. Oh, you know who John was? John was the guy who was going to work in your temple. He was supposed to be a priest like his dad, but he didn't want to do it. You know, he ended up by the Jordan River, and he just started, like, talking to himself and eating like locusts and wearing weird camel's hair. And he's like talking to himself out there. That's who the word of God came to? Man. So Luke is saying right off the bat, God doesn't care about power. God doesn't care about your followers. God doesn't care about your authority. Doesn't care about how much gold, how much power, all that to have. Because when he chose to come into this world, he goes way out in the boonies to a nobody that nobody knew. And that's who he comes to talk to. And that's just John the Baptist. We're not even at Jesus yet. Good job, compliments. Good job. Good job. Good job. Ready to go. Good sermon illustration. So this nobody, so that's the first part of the sermon, is that there's, there's and, and teens, you know this, man, there's just, there's so much... Social media will just crush you <laughs> because the, the compare game is just so real. You go on social media, you see something, someone's so beautiful, so pretty, so this, so that, not wearing much clothes, all this stuff, right? And it's a social media, it's, just, it's a disaster zone. And, you know, the story behind that picture took so much time and energy. Believe me, trust me, I know, that you have to, like, to make yourself look perfect, and you're not perfect. <laughs> Talk to a psychiatrist to say, you know, that person you see on there who has, uh, you know, a million followers, they're in my office the next day. <laughs> Because they're a disaster zone. I mean, not all of us. We all got stuff going on. But the, 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 the social media influencer will make you want, aspire to be like that. But this is not real. This has been doctored up. This has been photoshopped. That's not full real. You're not seeing the story behind it. And so God is saying here, well, let's look at our biggest influencers. That he, he shows in Luke the biggest influencers of the day. Um, that's not who God went to. You know, Jesus comes the second coming. He's not showing up at the biggest church. He's not showing up at the biggest political figure, the biggest economic figure, the biggest whoever figure to get his word out. He will probably go to some podunk place of some person who we don't know, and that's where Jesus is going to show up if he's going to repeat what happened here in, in, in Luke. So God just wants you. God wants you completely in your brokenness. God decided to talk to John, and all John had, John the Baptist, he was obedient, and he was humble. He was obedient to God, and he was humble. That's what you got to focus on for Evan, obedience and humility. Obedience, when we get off track, we want to do our own thing, don't want to follow God's law. Wake up in the morning, we, we, we drop to our knees, and we start worshiping a different God. Wake up some mornings, and I want to worship a God of anxiety. <laughs> worship a God of anger. Worship a God of fear. Worship a God of pride. Big. Yeah, it's all big, right? That's the opposite of humility. You keep yourself humble and you keep yourself obedient to just the one and true God. God will pour his glory into you. Pour his glory into you. And you don't have to be the big supervisor, the big chief, the big head honcho. You don't have to be validated by anyone else. And you don't have to validate anyone else, too. We get caught in that game where we want to judge and validate others. No, no, no. The only person who validates any of us is the one who made us, and that's the God who loves us. So how do you do that during Advent? How are you going to invite more obedience and humility in your life? So if you've been reading the book, not this book, we've been all reading that Advent book that's out there in the front. It's Pauses for Advent. 
Trevor Hudson talks about two things this last week, which I loved. The decision to take on something for abstinence and engagement. He says, two great ways to invite God's presence in your life. First thing of abstinence. What, what, what can you abstain from? What, what influence? There's influencers everywhere that want your heart. They want you bad. What are the biggest influences in your life right now that you can abstain from? Think about something that gives us so much influence right now. I'll tag one. News networks. <laughs> Huge influencers. Remember, their biggest department is not journalism. Their biggest department in, the, in that building at HQ <laughs> is the marketing department. <laughs> They just need your eyeballs. They want to influence you. They want to direct you. They want to tribalize you. They want to bring you in. I'm not saying it's all bad. You can't go live in a cave. You got to know what's going on in the world. But it's an influencer. John the Baptist is saying, let's beware of the influencers. Because those news networks would be up here. They're powerful. Wow. They can make a message and people will say, yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm following. That's a lot of power. John the Baptist says, beware of that. If that is giving you more influence than God above, that's an idol. That's an idol. If that influencer is leading you to places of anger, places of division, places of hatred, places of anything that's not love, that's not about God. If it ain't about love, it ain't about God. Other influencers, social media, celebrities, social influencers, everything, even your own family, that's an influence. <laughs> Got to be aware of that. Sometimes we get toxic relationships. It gets a little dysfunctional. Make sure your validation and your influence is coming from the word of God. Because you got that funky relationship, maybe with, a, with, with, your, with your parent. <laughs> and when you listen to that negative criticism, you start to think of yourself as less than, this than, which leads you to do dysfunctional things. Stop that. Who's the one who created you? Who's the one who loves you? Who's the one who's pouring into you? That's, all, that's the person you've got to be obedient to. And then Engagement. So when you abstain from anything, like I told you last week, so I read that book, you know, the, the alcohol experiment. So now I, I've been drinking booze. Well, it creates this, this, this space. What are you going to do with all that space? <laughs> so I drink a lot of Pellegrino now. <laughs> uh, but you, you have to fill that space with something. If not, those temptations will come right back at you. So if you abstain, let's say, from a news network, you abstain from social media, you're going to abstain from whatever it might be, you're going to create a vacuum, what are you going to do with that vacuum? So he talks about these things that can give us engagement. And one of the days, I think it was two days ago, he talks about the power of a key. The key. You know this? And he says the key, how Jesus is the key to access is us, that opens our heart to God to pour into us, and also for us to pour into God. Who does that? Jesus. Jesus is the key. And he says, so for you to remember that, every time you touch a key during the day, remember who is unlocking your heart. That Jesus is the one. You're no longer separated from God. Jesus has died for your sin. You're open that key. So you, it's a beautiful day. Go back and read the one. It's so good. Uh, and he will open your heart. But every time you put your hand in your pocket and you touch a key, or your fob for your car, or your gate pass, whatever it may be, unlock my heart, God. Unlock my heart. Because throughout the day, Advent's ways for us to wake up so we're always in the presence of God, even during the mundane things. Father Todd, during his talk on uh, Thursday, we've been doing these interviews with him um, called uh, tea, tea Time with uh, Father T, or Tea Time with Hot Toddy, that's what we call it. <laughs> his new retirement name is Hot Toddy. He, he loves it. He loves it. Just, just say it. He loves it. He'll say Christian. So, but, but, so, but he talked about how, he, you know, if you go into his office, he has these little wooden crosses. And he always puts one of those little wooden crosses in his pocket. So throughout the day, when he puts his hand in his pocket, and if he's stuck in the middle of an administrative meeting or something that's stressing him out, he reminds, oh, who is the one who died for me? Who is the one who's constantly forgiving me? Oh, it's Jesus. Just like engage, engage with something healthy and positive. Get these little tactile things. The Episcopal Church, we're very tactile. Myself, I know that I was taking down a painting the other day, and I had three nails. And I put these three nails, and I had them in my pocket. Okay, I don't recommend this to everyone. Um, <laughs> but it worked for me at the time. Uh, because, you know, it, it's it just, there's just been a lot of grief lately in, in our family. And so that the nails, I was going to put, I was like, ooh, ow, i got to put these away. And I felt like God was saying, no, you need to hold on to these. You need to hold on to these nails. 
You need to know who, who, who gets your suffering, who gets your loss. Jesus does. God came to earth, and what did he do? He, he, didn't, he didn't avoid suffering. He suffered. So you're all good, Christian. Every time you touch these nails, you know that God, Jesus, is suffering with you. It's like, thank you, God. I held those down those for like three weeks. Just always put the nails in my pockets. Again, I don't recommend it to everyone. I've been walking around with like, you know, bloody fingers. So I think there's different things you can do. That's more of a Lenten practice. We have some nails I think are safe here at the church you can use. Find something like that, whether it's a key, whether it's a little cross. We have the, the, the holy hands, or no, I'm sorry, what are they called? Prayer, prayer, the, the prayer squares. But who is the people making? What's the ministry? praying hands. They just soak these pieces of fabric in prayer. They so, so, and so. They're out there. You put that in your pocket. Oh, man. You got a whole squad of women who've been praying over that fabric the whole time, and now it's blessed for you. Keep that for all of Advent. So take on something to abstain from, and the reason why you take that ab to, to abstain is to create the space to engage with God. Engage specifically and especially during the mundane, during the day-to-day -day activities, when it's just the rote stuff over and over again. You grab the key. You're engaging with God. You feel that fabric. Feel the nail if you feel safe with that. <laughs> you find whatever that is. Keep yourself involved. Because why? Well, that podunk preacher says, prepare the way of the Lord. He's quoting Isaiah. Make his path straight. If your paths are all full of stuff, all full of junk, Christmas Day is going to be a hallmark holiday for you. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. If this is full of other stuff and full of to-do lists and full of anger and full of lust and full of just whatever, everything but God, this ain't going to be a big party for you. John the Baptist wants your life transformed, wants you to be reborn on Christmas Day, and you need all of, all of Advent to do that. Every day, God, transform my heart. Lead me, God, to abstain from blank and help me to engage with your love. Help me to walk away from pride and to embrace humility today. Lord God, I've got so much anger on my plate. Help me today to just abstain from that anger and instead I'm going to just, just, just dive into a world of joy with you. Why? I'm saved by you. Glory be to God, you died for me. I'm good. Why can't I embrace that, God? Teach me during Advent every day to trust in that. God, I could be a selfish person. I know I can. Sometimes I, I drop the ball as a husband. I drop the ball as a friend. I drop the ball as whatever it may be. I want to be reborn. I want to be reborn. This is Advent. So obedience and humility is our focus. John the Baptist is showing us that. And how are we going to do that? What are you abstaining from? And then what are you going to engage with? And what does that look like on Christmas morning? Where do you want your heart to be in two weeks when you take this journey? What is, what is that one spiritual gift in you that you would love to brighten up? You want the spiritual gift of forgiveness more? Compassion? Patience? What is it? Identify and say, God, let me take this journey. Jesus wants it for you. Jesus is inside you. Clear the space. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Amen. All right. All right, friends, let's stand and profess our faith in our holy God by saying our beliefs in the Nicene Creed.